it is so easy to become discouraged in this world to want to give up, especially when we're dealing with things of faith. Have you ever felt that way? Well, we're going to talk in just a few minutes about that very thing. Stick around. in a baseball house. My dad loved baseball. He played in college and he passed that on to me. He coached all my teams. He bought me baseball cards. We went to Philadelphia Phillies game. It was a way for us to connect. And one day he took me to Cooperstown, the major league hall of fame for baseball players. Walked around just starry-eyed looking at people like Babe Ruth or Mickey Mantle. These guys were just amazing. I wanted to be one of those people. I wanted to be in Hall of Fame, and so I was like, yeah, that's that's me. Now, it comes as no surprise to anybody that I'm not in the Baseball Hall of Fame. Yeah, I realized pretty quickly that there are a few things it took to, to get to that level. One was a whole lot of God-given talent, which I did not have, and I also desired to really work hard with, with that talent. It, I later learned that being um, shaped like a ninth grader perpetually as an adult didn't really help out either. Not really built to be a professional athlete. So it didn't take me long to figure. I did not have what it took to be a professional baseball player, let alone a Hall of Famer. Those guys that I looked at, man, they just, they were out of reach um, and out of touch with what I, what I was going through, like I, I could never get to that level. I didn't have uh, the ability. A lot of times when we compare, we're left thinking, yeah, man, I just don't measure up. And sometimes we do that spiritually. We can look around and say, man, I, I don't, I'm not like that. So-and-so, they seem to have it figured out. And even when we look at stories in the Bible, we, are, we can be left thinking, oh, man, uh, I don't measure up to, to them. We compare and, you know, we're going to be in Hebrews chapter 12 today. And, and last week we talked about Hebrews 11. And there's spiritual giants in, in there. There's a long list of men and women. And it's called like the, the Bible Hall of Faith. These are people that are, we, we get wowed by. And when I look at those people, I say, wow, I see my inadequacies. I see how I'm, I'm not that. I don't have what it takes. And I wonder if... Some of you feel that way too. Look at, at people and others, and they seem to have it all together. And we look at ourselves and we're like, we're just ordinary, flawed people. However, one of the things as we jump into to this passage today is that in Hebrews hap- chapter 11, it's just different. Hebrews 11 does not exist so that we can be discouraged. We look at that and we're like, oh no, that's not good. It exists so that we can be encouraged. God gave us this section of the Bible to say, hey, look at these people. If they can do it, I can do it too. And so Hebrews chapter 11, which provides a background today, is built to help us, encourage us to say, you, need, you can run the race. Well, what type of race are we talking about? Growing up, I was in track, and I had a choice between long distance and short distance. So I could run a mile, or I could run 100 meters. Yeah, I took the 100 meters. I was like, well, that seems a whole lot easier. But I was amazed at these people who kept running and running and running. Uh, one foot, they just kept putting one foot in front of the other. 
It's been said that the journey of faith is often uh, compared to like a, as a marathon and not a sprint. And, and so the lifetime journey is going to be amazing, but it's going to take endurance, perseverance over time. And that is what we're going to talk about today. The encouragement is to hang in there, keep going to run the race. And so those who came before us set an example. They motivate and encourage us that these people could practice faith in real life conditions. We could too. How do I know that? It's because of what's said in Hebrews chapter 12. Now, as we jump in here, it's important to just remember where what the writer's uh, point is. He was writing to Jewish believers, and they were considering walking away from the faith. And he said, well, slow, slow down. You know, Jesus is way better. What you left, I mean, Jesus is way better than that. And also, like, hang in there. You can do it. Do not give up. And Hebrews chapter 12, verse 1 starts with the word, therefore. So he's connecting what he said about these hall of faith people to these people that are reading. So what he had said now combined with what he is said, saying, and this word is such so interesting. When he says, therefore, it, it's, it's a unique word. It's kind of constructed from three different words that he basically smooshed together. It's like he's saying, therefore, therefore, therefore. And into what he's saying in chapter in chapter 12, verse 1. Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles. And let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us. He's saying, hey, you've, you've had this great cloud of witnesses. And there are legendary people that he referenced just a chapter ago. People like Noah, Abraham. Joseph, Moses, Rahab, these big dogs. He says, we're, we're like surrounded by these people. And it's using this imagery, this race imagery of, of being in the stadium. And these people are in the stands. But it's a little bit different because those people aren't there to watch us. Those people are there to be seen by us. And so all the people mentioned in chapter 11 are there to remind us the regular people just like us us. Ordinary people, extraordinary God. Now, you might say, they don't seem so ordinary to me, and I get it. I mean, the, these people, we're just wowed by them when we read their stories, but let's be honest. They had their failures and shortcomings, too. What set them apart was that they lived like God was telling the truth. They believed God's promises, and their lives reflected that. They ran the race, their race of faith, and now it's our turn to run our race of faith. And so the author here gives his readers three commands about running the race of faith. Since we have these examples of faith, let's first run free. Let's read verse 1 again. Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles. So the first thing that we're commanded to do is throw off everything that hinders. In the ancient Greek Olympics, they would literally strip down before their events. And that's kind of the idea here. If you watch the Olympics, those, those athletes didn't, didn't run in their warm-ups. They took them off. The swimmers, they shaved their bodies. They were trying to take off everything that would possibly slow them down, even if it was a fraction of a second. So what does the writer here want the people to, to throw off? If you notice here, it says, let us throw off everything that hinders. That's the first thing. Those things are there that hold us back or weigh us down from running the race well. There's no way that even the world's best Olympic athletes would strap a 50-pound sack on their back to run the race. They don't want anything to weigh them down that they shouldn't be carrying. So the command here is to throw off whatever is hindering, whatever's weighing you down, whatever is a, a burden. Now, these things don't necessarily have to be sinful in and of themselves. There might be relationships that you have that are distracting you, weighing you down, hindering you from running your race of faith. Maybe it's a job or hobby, a pastime, social media. 
Netflix. It's also important to understand that what hinders one person doesn't necessarily hinder another person. I've met people who are distance runners, legit distance runners who refuse to wear shoes. Like that's hard for me to even fathom. They feel that the shoes hinder them, so they take them off. They, they, they want to feel the earth beneath their feet. No way. Like, if you see me running, number one, check to see if someone's not chasing me because I don't typically run. But if I'm running, I'm having shoes on because I'm, that would be so distractive. Am I going to step on a piece of glass, this big rock, maybe a bee? It would hinder my race where it didn't hinder someone else's race. And so we need to answer for ourselves. Are there things in our lives that are hindering us from running our race of faith? Are there things that are weighing us down to be able to run well? If so, we need to identify them and to throw them off. What else needs to be thrown off here in verse 1? Let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles. So the second thing is we need to throw off the sin that entangles. There are certain things that we are just prone to want to give into you. These things, these things are sin. Things that God says are not good and right. These sins, sins not only hinder us from running, but they can prevent us from running. Kind of place us onto the sidelines of life. And that's not where we want to be. It mentions here that we get entangled by them. This idea of like, can you imagine running with a rope tied around your legs? That's not going to work out well. That's not how it's intended. And so the point here that he's trying to say is, you know, you need to strip off all these sins, the sins that so easily trip us up. How do we do that? Well, again, the, the sins that entangle um, for you might not be the same for, for me. We need to answer that for ourselves. What do we really struggle with? What do we have a hard time with? The thing is, you know you well. I know myself well. These things, if we're really paying attention, should be pretty easy to say, oh yeah, I definitely struggle with this. Let's be honest. And so we identify those things to strip them off. Sins, some sins I, I came up with that are just so easily entangle Americans, you think of things like selfishness, lust, greed, Those things tend to have a hold on Americans. And sometimes we don't even look at those things as being bad. As a result, people are sidelined in running the race because they're entangled by those things. There are other things that can easily entangle. Things like laziness or lying, hatred, unforgiveness. Whatever it is for you, the writer here is saying to run your race well, You've got to strip that off, take it off, and leave it behind. And so this is going to take a conscious, a thoughtful, direct approach. We've got to be intentional in identifying these things. Okay, here it is. Here's here's this thing that's easily looking to trip me up again. And no, we're going to reject that. And it's going to take effort. It's going to be allowing God to work and opening ourselves up regularly to God, confessing these things and repenting from that. Not just for God's glory, but this is for our good so that we can run free. And the next thing we can do is to run faithful. Again, verse 1. Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles, and let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us. Run faithful. So he's saying, after we have stripped off the things that have hindered us, the sins that um, are going to entangle us, now we're told to run with endurance and perseverance, to keep running the race. This word race, we get our word agony from it. So let's be honest. The race of faith is hard. As I said before, it's not a sprint, it's a marathon. You watch the Olympics, there was a woman who won the 100-meter dash in under 11 seconds. There was a woman who won the, from Kenya who won the marathon in two and a half hours. One's an all-out dash, the other one requires a steady pace. Marathons take 
endurance. Now, if we were all going to run just a few feet, everybody would be in, could be in, and they would make it, whether fast or slow, they could all finish. But we decided, hey, let's go ahead and have a race from Bellwood to State College. Uh, people probably think you're joking. Like, no, there's not, like, why would I even do that? There's only a few people who might even start that race. Because it's going to be hard. It's going to be grueling. The race of faith is difficult. If you look at all the tough times that people experienced just in the previous chapter, let's just look at two. Um, Joseph. Joseph was a guy who was a favorite son who became a slave. He was a foreigner, put in prison, forgotten, and also hated. We want his story of success, but need to remember that he ran faithfully in the difficult times. How about Moses? Moses is a, a different case. He grew up in, in privilege and then became a murderer who was a fugitive, isolated for f- about 40 years, he had anger issues, and he also ran his race of faith faithfully. So let's, let's all understand that f- following Jesus isn't always rainbows and unicorns. That's not how it goes. It's going to be hard. We're going to suffer. We're going to want to give up. We're going to be overwhelmed. We're going to need perseverance. We need some staying power. And part of that, part of that equation is understanding our part. It's very simply, we, we need to run our race faithfully. Joseph's race was his to run. Moses's race was Moses's race. We are to run the race, as you can see here in verse 1, that is marked out for us. God has a course marked out for you. In all of his wisdom and love and grace, God has a race specifically picked out for you. It's a, it's a course that's unique to you that will have its own challenges and difficulties. Again, chapter 11 no two lives were the same. This is not a standard, make the two laps around the track and it's, everything's even. You know, you see some of these guys, man, it seems like uphill all the time, twists and turns. Others are like, wow, that's a pretty straight path and doesn't seem a whole, whole, diff, whole difficult thing. God doesn't offer a, cu- a cookie cutter approach. So it's, it's not fair to compare your race with someone else. God has a race marked out specifically for you. And so whatever your course, whatever that looks like, you are called to run your race faithfully with perseverance and endurance to hang in there and run the race of faith. And thirdly, to run focused. Let's read verses two and three. Let us fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith, who the joy for the joy set before him endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him who endured such opposition from sinful men so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. Love this passage. He says, hey, you need to fix your eyes on Jesus to kind of lock in, to look intently at him and not be distracted by so many other things. On my wedding day, I got to stand up front and friends and family were were seated there. There were smiles a service started, and the bridesmaids walked down. Um, then something happened. The music changed, people stood up, and there was Naomi. And I was, wow. I was locked in. I'm guessing my mother-in-law's hair could have caught fire. I would not even notice. Why? Because my eyes were fixed on Naomi. And so the writer of Hebrews to this point has tried to say, listen, Jesus is better. And because Jesus is better, we need to make our, him our focus, not so many other, other things. They needed to hear that, simple wisdom, and we need that too. Think about a race. A runner should not be looking behind him, shouldn't be looking to the sides, down at, down at the, his feet, should be looking ahead. And in our race, we should be looking ahead towards Jesus to focus in on him. So that means stop looking at our circumstances. Stop looking at all the hardships. Stop looking around at other people and what they're doing in the race. 
stop being distracted by those things to fix our eyes on Jesus, to deliberately lift our eyes from those other things that distract and to concentrate on him, to continually make him our focal point. As, as you notice here, he says, focus in on the one who is the author and perfecter of our faith. He's the one that began the faith. He's the one that did it perfectly. In chapter 11, we see a lot of great people, people that we would consider spiritual giants. None of those people measure up to Jesus. They all fall short. The entirety of Jesus' earthly life was lived in perfect faith for his father. He perfected how to live by faith. And notice here in verse 2 what it says as it continues. Let us fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Wow. He looked at the cross and looked there with joy. Joy because he would provide salvation there. That was his focus, and that allowed him to endure. So these things that he endured are, are just crazy. All the, the beatings, the, the mockery, the crucifixion. And he said, here, it's, it's interesting, he's scorning the shame of those things. Yes, would there be shame involved on his mission to the cross? Absolutely. But that shame had little value to Jesus. It was not worth focusing in on. And then he sat down. He was finished. He sat down and is at the right hand of God the Father with all authority. The writer then commands us in verse 3. He says, Consider him who endured such opposition from sinful man so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. Consider him. Slow down and think about Jesus. Think about all that he endured, about the opposition that he faced, about what he went through. And what does the writer say? If you do that, what's going to happen? He says, and consider him who endured opposition from sinful men, so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. Growing weary? You want to give up? Consider Jesus. Are you getting tired of doing the right, the right thing? Consider Jesus. Are you facing suffering? Well, consider Jesus. His life will help us run the race of faith. Now, this passage is just chock full of application. And it's easy to just kind of go back and to ask a few questions that will help us run the race of faith. And that first is, are you, do you have things here that are hindering you from pursuing Jesus. Things that you need to take off that are weighing you down. What about sins? You have your sin. Like you need to identify what is it that you're prone to just give into and you're struggling with. Well, that also needs to be given to Jesus. What about your focus? Life is just so hard sometimes to focus on the things that matter. Are you focused in, locked intently on Jesus, so that you don't grow weary, that you're able to endure. What about taking the running theme, finding a running buddy, someone who's there will run with you, who will help you maybe identify some of these things in your life, saying, hey, um, I noticed that you have a sin issue. Can we talk about that? Hey, I, I see that you're going to, you're looking to give up. I want to encourage you to hang in there, to keep going with me. I will do this with you. Uh, my, my youngest is going to be a senior at Bellwood this year. He's a cross-country member. It's going to be his last year of running. We're looking forward to that. And one thing I didn't understand about the cross-country environment was that it was just so positive. You know, the parents line up while they're passing, and they're like, yay, woohoo! good job, you can do it, keep going. And I think some of that, some of that really overwhelming positivity, positivity is because we realize we could not run as far as they are. And we're just like, wow, I, I, you go. I can't, I can't do that. But there is a race that we can do. Yes, it, it's going to be hard. 
It's going to be filled with difficulties. We are going to want to give up, but we can hang in there. We can do this. We have people who have done it beforehand to show us that we can do it, and it's worth it. This is the, the race of a lifetime. It's what life is about. It's worth it because of Jesus. So let's fix our eyes on him and run with perseverance our race, one foot in front of the other for the glory of God, but also for our good. Let's pray. Father, we are so grateful for passages like this that guide us, direct us. We need these passages. Lord, help us as we sift through these things that your Spirit will reveal to us areas where we struggle, areas where we need your help. We need to identify these things so we can run our race well. We don't want to be sidelined. We want to be doing the very thing that life is about. So we're thankful for Jesus and his sacrifice who's gone before us that we can focus in on him. Help us to keep our eyes off of these other things that, that want to scream for our attention. And I pray that we would run our race with endurance, locked in on him. And again, it's for your glory and our good. So thank you for that. Pray that you would have our, your way in our lives. In Jesus' name, amen.